addicted it is right now. They're outside of this church. They're sick. They're depressed. They're uh, broken in heart and spirit. The last thing they want to do is come around and get around a bunch of church people. That's the truth of it. I'm just here to tell you. I didn't want nothing to do with it. They're outside of this church. They don't want nothing to do with it. We've got people in this Lighthouse Recovery Group, in the Ray of Hope Group. It's a stepping stone to let it, just give them a small taste of what a church family has. We're broken out here today. There's people that's here in this recovery group. They couldn't stand on their own. But now they're up. They're upright. They're clothed in the right mind. Joseph, Stephen, you got Ben, you got me. We all run the same groups, the same circles. We was a part of the same thing. It was a sin-filled life. Now whether you're an addict, whether you're doing drugs, it don't matter. You might just be in a sin-filled, natured life. They're fed up with that outside of this church just uh -huh. as much as the ones on, shooting Randy. heroin, snorting pills, uh, peddling pornography, whatever it might be. It is a sin-filled life. One is equal to a thousand. Come on, buddy. We can't be classified sin. If you're lost and undone, you need Jesus Christ to Amen. save you. Preacher. There ain't no rehab going to do it. Until you get redemption, you will not be the same again. You cannot just uh, uh, plug it in and, and put on a uh, coat and, and dress nice uh, and be somebody different. It has to start from come the inside on, of who you are. When we get down, we get depressed, and we can't stand on our own, we fall down. We try to stand up, and we can't. We don't know what to do, and we can't. And now we see these people. The ones in this recovery group and a lot of you Christians that's a part of a church, you see people down and you have compassion about it. Come on. You want to say, hey, I know who can help you stand. But we just tell them you need Jesus. You're doing it from over here. You're saying you need Jesus. Is that helping them? Uh -huh. You've got to come over and show them Jesus. Right. He'll help them stay. On. And then you get your other buddy over here. You see, it putting pressure on you. One guy can't do it. We've got to get shoulder and shoulder to fight this battle, this epidemic of addiction that's taking our communities, taking our churches. It's in our church, people. Don't act like it ain't. It is. We've got to call sin what it is. If we get like-minded and we get up against each other, we get shoulder to shoulder and have the same focus, and we hold these people up, and we show them what God's love can do, right. that's when change takes place. Come that's on, when preacher. they see God's love. That's Amen. when they know and realize Jesus loves them. Right. Just telling them Jesus loves them ain't going to do it. Right. Giving them a pencil that says God loves you ain't going to do it. Amen. You've got to show them God's love. Right. You've got to show them Jesus' love. Yes. You've got to let some of that Holy Spirit rub out on it. Amen. <laughs> it ain't Reggie. I ain't nothing. He's everything. Yes, sir. I can't do it, but I can do everything through Him. Amen. Thank God for that. But what you do, you keep your arms on them. You keep them hugged up. And then eventually what happens, God turns their life around. And then guess what? They can stand on their own. Uh -huh. They go out and they want to give something back to somebody else. That's the way it works. This is just something that was conveyed to me, something I wanted to put out, uh, I wanted to make a point with, uh, uh, and I'm, I'm silly enough to do what God tells me. Uh, or I'm smart enough, one of the two, uh, but we're going to do that. Uh, uh, but tonight we're going to be uh, uh, talking about uh, King David. Uh, and I mentioned that a lot of times when we don't feel good, uh, uh, we will uh, uh, withdraw. We will uh, uh, seclude. Uh, you, you, you'll say, well, why ain't you been coming to church? Or, or I ain't seen you in a while. Where you been? Uh, and they're staying away for some reason. Uh, uh, it's probably because they're depressed uh, or they got anxiety uh, or something just ain't right there somewhere with them. David in 1 Samuel chapter 22. 1 Samuel 22. Pray for me tonight. I'm nothing. I, I need Him. Help him Lord. I need Him. I need this message. It's been conveyed to me. Uh, it's been preached to me a while now. Uh, and I've been excited about this. Uh, uh, Randy said, well, uh, if you thought about it, I said, I'm ready to preach. Uh, and that was about two weeks ago. He said, that's what I want to hear. Yeah. Uh, and I love it when I know what message that I need to be putting out there. Uh, and we're all on this same team. Uh, don't just think you're here looking uh, uh, what the Lighthouse has going on, a Ray of Hope has going on. Uh, you need to be a, a 
uh, joining up by prayer uh, uh, and support uh, uh, and by word of mouth telling people that we have this. Then people's going to get a hold of something and then they're going to get in your church. And there's only one church. That's who we want to get them a part of is the church of the living God. Uh, we ain't pushing denominations. Uh, we're pushing Jesus Christ uh, and Him crucified uh, and Him coming back again for a church that is without spot or wrinkle. Uh, that's who we need to be is that church. The sinners have enough fault in the church. Let's not give them no more ammunition. Amen. <laughs> They're finding enough things wrong with the church. Let's don't be doing things to give them a black eye. Come on. We need to do that. We need to do better. I've heard my pastor Randall tell me many times, I believe that we need to get better at this. We should be getting better at this. If your Christian walk, you're not getting better, you better start praying. You better start searching His Word. We need to be doing better as Christians. Mm -hmm. That's the way we can make a difference and we can get people back on their feet. Mm -hmm. We can show them God's love. 1 Samuel 22, verse 1. David therefore departed thence and escaped to the cave Adol. And when his brethren and all his father's house heard it, they went down hither to him. They went down there to him. And everyone that was in distress... Mm -hmm. And everyone that was in debt, uh -huh. and everyone that was discontented, gathered themselves unto him, and he became a captain over them. Uh -huh. And there was with him about four hundred men. And David went thence to Mizpeh and Moab of Moab, and he said unto the king of Moab, Let my father and my mother, I pray thee, come forth, and will be with you till I know what God will do for me. A lot of times we need to get shoulder to shoulder until we know what God's going to do for Amen, us. Amen, Reggie. David needed it. We need it. Amen. And he brought them before the king of Moab, and they dwelt with him all the while that David was in the hold. And the prophet Gad said unto David, Abide not in the hold. Depart and get thee into the land of Judah. Then David departed and came into the forest of Herod. David secluded into a cave. He was into a cave. At this point in David's uh, history, uh, uh, he had been anointed the next king of Israel. But he hadn't been appointed yet. He knew what he had to do. He knew that he was anointed to be king. But he just hadn't been appointed yet. Saul was king and he was very jealous of David. Saul did his best to eliminate David. When we obtain salvation, Satan does his best to eliminate it from us. He does his best to get you to quit. Come on. He tries to weaken us. He does this early in a Christian walk. And he keeps doing it as you're in a Christian walk. I've seen people who's been on the, the highway for many, many years. Let them take it from you. Let Satan have it. We've got to claim it. We've got to stand on that rock. Satan's job is to eliminate us. Just as Saul was trying to eliminate David. He knew what was coming. David had something that Saul did not. Come on, brother. And that was God's favor. Uh -huh. You're going to have a chance. I love it when I can feel the church praying. I can feel prayers. Yes, sir. I can be in that barber shop and nobody around, and I've told people to pray, and I can feel it coming down. Come on, Reggie. If you're praying against me, I don't know who you're praying to, <laughs> but you ain't got a chance. That's right. God's favor is phenomenal. Amen. I'm not bragging because I'm something. I'm bragging because He's everything. Right. We can't get discouraged. You can't help somebody if you're discouraged. Amen. How many tonight know you're in God's favor? Amen. How many of you really know? How many of you are really holding on to the bad things that's going on, the turmoil that's going on in your family, that's going on that you heard on the phone call before you came? How many of you is hanging on to that instead of realizing you're in God's favor? I can see and understand why David was called a man after God's own heart. Yes, sir. I preach that a lot. 
I say that statement a lot because he wasn't acquitted according to the Christian. He wasn't perfect. Murderer, adulterer. Yeah. Don't let these addicts, don't let these people who have done running around, not even addiction, just sinful life, don't let them tell you that God don't have something for them. Amen. David was a man after God's own heart. Sure was. David could have killed Saul many times. Yes, sir. But guess what he did? He waited mm -hmm. on God's timing. Amen. Are we waiting on God's timing? How many times do we get impatient when we know what God's going to do? Yeah, we're good at it. Uh -huh. oh, yeah. Okay, Randall, we're good at it. We kind of see where God's going with something, and we'll get the old cart before the horse. Yep, sure we'll get the old preacher before the God. Amen. Guilty. Guilty, oh, yeah. It happens. We do it often. We need to wait on God's timing. It's important. You'll get in the way. You'll be a stumbling block instead of a stepping stone to get them on the rock of Jesus. Yeah, man. David's running as an outlaw, as a fugitive, was just beginning here. Yeah. David didn't get frustrated or angry with God. That's right. How often times do we? Mm -hmm. How many times do we get angry and frustrated with God? Because it's not happening quick enough for us. Yeah. But when He's calling us to do something, how quick are we moving? Amen. Are we jumping when He says jump? But we expect Him to jump when we tell Him to. It don't work that way. It's a relationship. God loves us. David remained faithful to him even in the worst conditions. In the worst situations, David remained faithful. Do we? Do we do that? As I was reading this passage, there was something that stuck out to me. It spoke to my heart. That's what I want to share with you tonight. David escaped into a cave. There's times that I get down and I go and I withdraw and, and I just kind of get away and, 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 and I, I understand that's probably humanistic and a lot of us do that. You'll get away. You'll get in solitude. You'll get by yourself. David wanted to get away. But guess what happened? Yes. And everyone that was in distress. <laughs> and everyone that was discontented. Come on, man. Everyone that was discontented gathered themselves unto him. Man. And he became captain over them. Yeah. <laughs> and there were with him about 400 men. Yeah. Come on, man. man, that's good. Man. That's good. How many times did God send someone to come looking for you? How many times do you get that phone call or that message to pick you up when you need it the most? <coughs> Those people did that because they were drawn to David. Yeah. But it wasn't David that they was drawn to. That's right. <laughs> they were drawn to the Spirit of God that was inside David. Amen. When people's drawn to us, we don't need to take advantage of that. Right. A lot of people do. Matt had a sermon up at our church and, and, and I remember him, he made a statement and he said that Reggie has favor with some people that I don't have favor with. And I have favor with some people that he don't have favor with. And we need to use that. We need to capitalize on that. It makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Don't take advantage when you have favor with someone. Yeah. When someone looks up to you as a Christian, when someone reaches out and says, man, how did you do it? How did you get help? How are you staying clean? Don't you fail to tell them. Yeah. Yeah. Don't you fail to show them. Amen. Don't you fail to go with them to get them there. Amen. We've got to do more. Amen. These people that came to David were frustrated with no end in sight. People who are in active addiction are frustrated with no end in sight. I know. I was there. I know. I have friends still there. <coughs> People who are living a life without Christ are frustrated yeah. with no end in sight. They're trying everything. They're laying their head in the lap of the world. 
and they're expecting it to get better. Yeah. And Satan's providing something new and something new and something new, and then there's nothing else new. Sin's good for a season. We need to be there when people are sick of their sinful lifestyle. Not to look down on them. Not to say, you need Jesus. But I got to do this. They're praying for you. That's it. Yeah, I'll, I'll be back. I got to go to this. I'll, I'll pray for you when I get back. We've got to show people Jesus. The distressed found hope in David for a better future. Another thing I saw when I read this, people left their homes to follow a man who was in a cave. <laughs> yeah. How could he help them? <laughs> kind of reminds me when Jesus, when they said, wherever you go, I'm going to go with you. Yeah. And they tell, he says, well, I don't even have a place to lay my head. <laughs> and then they're like, wait a minute, did I say I was going to go with you? <laughs> Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. I, I have this and this and this to do. Then I'll go with you. I thought you stayed at the Holiday Inn. I didn't know you didn't have a pillow or a bed. You're the Son of God. You don't have a place to lay your head. I thought I was going with you, but maybe I'll reconsider that. They went with David to a cave. We've got to think the way people are in in their life, no matter what we have going on in ours, our worst condition is still better than what they're going through. Come on, preacher. We got to think it's really not that bad, whatever we're going through. Right. And when we fail to think that, that's when God puts people in our life to show us <coughs> there's others who have it a lot worse than what we're going through. Right. Mm -hmm. He opens our eyes. A true Christian that's looking through God's eyes will realize the needs of others outweigh their personal concerns. My personal concerns gets put on hold. Often we are needing and are wanting and are crying and are calling for help will get put on hold when someone else needs our help. Come on, Reggie. Come on, church. This person, this person needs a, has a need greater than ours. Right. Yeah. This is where David was. Uh -huh. These people had a need greater than his. This was the way God was using people. We are the body of Christ. Uh -huh. Let God use us. Are we using? Are we being used? Or are we just form and fashion? Yeah. Holding the schedule. Yeah. Being here from 7 to 8.30, we, sometimes we stay on nine. Are we really doing God's work outside of this church? Whoa. We need to be the body of Christ. Right. We need to be obedient through that. Amen. Godly people, godly Christians will put others first. Yep, yep. We're not selfish. Right. We take care of them. We put ourselves, we put our stuff on a shelf, whatever we have going on, I need to help them. We can't cry about it, we can't complain about it. We can just get to them and help them. We get their needs met. The best thing you can do when you're in recovery, or when you've recovered, God recovered me. Thank God He made me not who I once was. <laughs> You go into those rooms, they'll tell you, I'm all, uh, my name's Reggie and I'm an addict. I'll always be an addict. That's what the secular world will tell you. Yes, it is. Honey, when, G, when the devil moves out and Christ moves free. in, you're a new creature. Amen. You no longer think like you used to. You never no longer do addict behavior. Uh -huh. You are born again. Amen. Thank God for that. Amen. That's redemption, baby. Amen. You can't beat that. If you could sell it, they'd spend it all. <laughs> you can't sell it. Jesus paid it all. Right. You've got to accept it. Right. You've got to accept what He's given you. What I'm trying to point out, there are times when our cave becomes 
others' deliverance. Mm. We think we're secluding and we can't help anybody and woe is me and, and I really don't have nothing for anybody and I don't know what I'm going to do. And, uh, but yet, that's when deliverance for someone else comes out of your situation. That's what happened here. People won't understand how we can do that as Christians. It's through and by Him is how we do it. We don't say, how do you do that? How do you put your stuff aside and help them? Well, I don't know. That's your chance to testify. That's your chance to say through and by the grace of God, He gives me. I am all things through Him. They don't understand how we can do it. And there's a lot of times that I don't understand how we do it. There's a lot of times I see things and do things that I don't even know how I'll do it. But yes, I do. It's through Him. Right. It blows my mind. But it's right to do the godly thing with people. This world we're living in is selfish and self-serving. Self yeah. We live in a self-serving world. Right. We as Christians on, don't need to be self-serving. The world's getting enough of that. We've got to serve others. When reality comes knocking on your cage door, that's when you know what God's going to call you to do. When you think you have nothing to give, the only thing to do is rescue. We've got to rescue people. That's what this is about. We can't just drive by and, and pray when God's saying, pull in, do, do something. We've got to, what is it, put feet on your prayer. Yeah. Put some elbow grease in your prayers. Yeah. Don't just say, God, help them. Say, God, how can I help them? Amen. He'll show you. Yeah. Right. Don't be afraid to pray. And he will show you. And He will give you the knowledge. He will give you the strength. He will give you the resources. Mm -hmm. I'm proud of what Joseph started and Ben. They sat up there in a room and just stared at each other for two, three months. Maybe more. More? More. At least Randy, they got a few of them, more of them to stare at each other. They didn't just start with two. But that group that they did, the vision that Joseph had and came back and implemented there's been other ones based their pattern off that. Ray of Hope based their pattern off what Joseph and Ben had a vision. Nothing to glorify Joseph. That's not, he knows I'm not doing that. We're glorifying his vision. I know he said, God, how can I help? I want to help people like you help me. God gave him a vision. And he did something. Our recovery groups are made up of broken people, once broken people, willing to put their problems to the side and help others. Ain't that good? Yes, sir. That's great. We need to be doing that. As a church, as the body of Christ, we need to do that. Through Christ, they try to help the distressed and the indebted and the discontented, just as David did. Mm -hmm. They're doing the same thing. When we do this as a church, we reap the benefits. Psalms 41 and verse 1. You don't do it to get back. You rather say, well, you reap what you sow. Well, I'm going to do a lot of good sowing because I want to do a lot of good reaping. Mm -hmm. Ain't that how it is? That's more like self-serving to me. Uh -huh. But I don't want to sow nothing bad because I know it's coming back. Yeah. I want to sow good. It says, Blessed is he that considereth the poor. Psalms 41 and verse 1. Blessed is he that considereth the poor. The Lord will deliver him in time of trouble. The Lord will preserve him and keep him alive. And he shall be blessed upon the earth. And thou wilt not deliver him into the will of his enemies. Do you know that the Christian church has enemies? We've got things to do in order to not be delivered into the hands of our enemies, church. If we're not doing as God's called us to do, He'll get our attention. I don't want to be there. He'll get your attention. 
The Lord will preserve him and keep him alive. And he shall be blessed upon the earth. And thou will not deliver him unto the will of his enemies. The Lord will strengthen him upon the bed of languishing. Thou wilt make all his bed in his sickness. He will keep us. He will supply all of our needs. As in, as in the riches of glory. Jesus Christ. We can't outgive God. We've got to do more. This is preaching to me too. I'm not, don't just say, well, he thinks he's doing so much, he's telling me to do more. We need to do more. Amen. We. Amen. Not you. We. Right. Saul couldn't help these people. Like David could. Saul probably added to their problems. Sure. He kept them down. Oppression. He co-pressed them. He kept them down. The 400 men may not have been the elite, but they were dedicated and making David religious. their captain. That's what happened. You give me four guys that's behind me, I'll take that over a couple that's real strong any day that's just half-hearted in it. Give me some people that's absolutely like-minded, ready to roll, whatever it takes, we're going to get it done. That's the people I want. That's the people that God sent to the cave for David. Like-minded people. Let's roll. They done it. God doesn't call you to salvation because you're qualified. You can't get yourself in order to earn salvation. He qualifies you after you're called. He'll build you up. He'll work you into what you need to be. I've heard people say, I just want to help. I ain't real good at anything. I just want to help. What can I do? I wish we all had that attitude when we pray to God. He would give us something to do. When you get saved, when I got saved, I came as nothing and I left with something Come on. I'm still nothing but you leave with something everything I am is because of him I did it my way for too long never worked when I started doing it his way he's repaid everything that I've lost a few times fold I'm talking emotion. I'm not talking about money, people. I'm talking about emotionally. People in my life. A wife, a family. Yeah. Things that I thought that I've thrown away that I could never have. God give it back. <laughs> we need to carry that message to the people out there. Yeah. Stephen can carry it. He's done told you tonight. He was a little nervous. But praise God, he got up here, didn't he? I know there's people here praying for him while he's standing here. I see heads nodding. Ain't that good? We're a family. Yes, sir. We're a family. You might, your earthly family, your physical family might say, I never want nothing to do with you again. God will put a spiritual family in your life to take their place four and five, ten, ten times fold. And then God will eventually give them back to you too. God's good. You can't outgive God. Praise God. I'm telling you. It's all I could do set back here. I was going to have Jeff hold me in the pew. I was about to come up here. As soon as Richard said get in, I was getting ready to come on. I didn't want to get challenged. Whatever hardship that we think we're going through, whatever hardship that we've been through, we can relate and witness to others that God's able to get us through that. Just like Matt said about the favor. It's not really, maybe it's not a favor, but it's things in common. They remember Matt and what he used to be. They remember me what I used to be. They remember Richard what he used to be. They remember Randall what he used to be. And they're, they're like, hey, I was more like him when he was in the world. Maybe I should go talk to him. Yeah. Yeah. Praise God. Come on. When you know somebody like that, if you can't help them, you can't tell them what they need. Send them to me. If they're like what I used to be, send them to me. I'll talk to them. Right. 
If I if I know that Ben helps them more than me, I send them to Ben. Sure. We can relate to the lost. That's who. That's why God uses people that has a muddy past because He can reach the muddy again. Don't ever fail to tell people who you once was before you met God. Don't act like you're something up on a shelf and you're all dawed up and nothing stained. Everything I got stained or got a rip in it. Don't act like you're something that you're not. People find more commonality with that. I don't even know if that's the right word. But they, don't, they find more commonality with that than putting on a show. That's that word humble. People get proud. This pride. Pride cometh before destruction. Satan wants to use pride. He uses pride in the Christian. He uses pride in the lost to keep them from hitting their knees and repenting. Pride. I hate it. Does it try to get in? Sure. Do I quench it? Sure. Get out. Get behind me. I know what you're trying to do. The three things. You deny yourself. Pick up the cross and you follow Him. Daily. Daily. That's not a one-time occurrence. i got to do that daily. If not, that old man tries to get back where I once was. What we're trying to say here tonight is you can take your cave situation and turn it into a recovery center. Come on, preacher. Mm -hmm. You can take what you once was and share it with somebody and turn it into a recovery station. They call a thing in <clears throat> trading war stories. If you've been in a if you ever went to a facility, the detox or whatever, they'd say no war stories, no glamorizing it. You get in there and you start talking about the parties you did and how cool it was, they'd shut that down in a hurry. Because you're in there and you're starting to think about how cool it is instead of how sick and how you've lost your kids, you've lost your car and you lost your house, the devil wants you to start looking at it as being glamorous again. He don't want you to think about the destruction that that crap does in your life. But you can share that with people. Not glamorizing it. Tell them it's, com it's common ground. You find that common ground and you use it for the glory of God. Turn your cave into a recovery center. It's a place of recovery. Churches need to be a place where people recover. We need to tell people that we're not a perfect bunch of people talking about how perfect we are. We're here... Recovering. Not recovering from things of the past, but just the things from the week. The things that's going on in our lives. We've got to find common ground. The testimonies that come up. Help me. you got a testimony? Give it. It's in order. That helps. You don't understand how much. Man, it cut loose at our Christmas program. Had a man get saved. Been under conviction. Packed house. Shy guy. Yeah. I was thinking, that's the power of God. Yes, sir. You don't pick when you're coming. You just, you just go when, it, when it, you know it's now or never. You go. If that boy could have picked, he'd have picked when there's about 15 people in the church. He picked when there's about 170. But the power of God was in that building because of people's obedience. Amen. Testimonies was being given in a large crowd. Tough to do. Proud of you, Stephen. I love you. We've got to be obedient. David knew that God had more in store for him than being just in that cave. I looked up some of these pictures of this place. It would be pretty cool to go there. Pretty neat. He was in that cave, but he knew it wasn't God's timing. He knew he had more coming. And the main thing, people say, well, he was scared of Saul. He was running from Saul. He knew that his life wasn't in Saul's hands. He was being obedient to God. 
That's what we need to do. David knew his life wasn't going to stay distressed. He knew what was going on. The Bible says David departed, we read that, into the forest of Her Herod. He went into the forest of Herod. The forest was David's refuge. He got to where he needed to go. I preach on refuge every now and then. I love it. Place of refuge. Boy, we all need that. Yeah. Isn't it good when we can get it here? In a church in God's house? Place of refuge. If you come and this is where turmoil's at, shame on you. Yep. This ought to be the most glorious place to be, the most spirit-filled place. Leave that stuff at home. Leave it at the altar. Forget about it. Right. Refocus. Amen. The forest was God was David's refuge. This passage, this part of the passage shows me that when we help people recover, God will bring us to our recovery. Yes. He will bring us to where all those problems that we left on the shelf that we was going to go back and have to solve after we help them, are gone. They're taken care of. <clears throat> there is a place of refuge for you tonight. There's some here tonight that's discouraged. I know there's some here that's frustrated. There's some here that's hurt. There's people here that's broken. You need to... Find someone to help you recover. Amen. There's plenty of people that will help you recover. The reality is that not only do you need to recover, you might be used to help someone else recover. Mm -hmm. That's why Satan works so hard to keep people from obtaining salvation. Because it's a snowball effect. It's a domino effect. Mm -hmm. It builds. Amen. They see him, well, the Satan don't care if you go to church. He don't care, just don't get saved. Because he knows once you get saved, you're going to witness to people. Mm -hmm. You're going to tell people about how good God is. Yeah. You're going to lead people to salvation that you obtain. That's why the pressure is so hard on the sinner to not obtain salvation. Satan tricks people into think they have nothing. Nothing to offer. I run a lot of trail cameras. Pray for me. Sometimes it gets frustrating. <laughs> we had a cold snap in van and I went way up on this mountain. I always carry batteries in my pockets. I get up to my camera and it runs out eight AA batteries. And I had batteries, I knew I had them in my pack. And I got up to check that camera, pulled my car, put a new card in, looked at battery life, and it was zero. I thought, well, I got batteries. Well, okay, let's put some new batteries in. Pull out my batteries, and there's seven batteries. <laughs> and I needed eight. So, did I cry? Did I think, well, I'll just have to wait till I get me eight batteries and come back? No. I thought about that battery that's dead. The one that's dead. It's like what we showed earlier. I took that one battery that was dead and I put it with the seven brand new powerful batteries. I put it in that trail camera and I flipped it on. I thought, well, let's see what this happens. See what happens here. When you put eight brand new batteries in a trail camera and you flip it on, it tells you the battery life. And it said, it says 99% when you got eight batteries in it, brand new. I put one dead one, seven brand new ones in it, flipped it on, and it said 99%. That's, that's how good God is. You take that one dead person, dead in sin, thinks they don't have nothing to offer. You don't understand that there, there's probably seven Christians 
that's going to boost up by when they get plugged in. We build off each other. We can't do it alone. He leaves the 99 to go look for the one. We need to mix with the dead more. We know what we have. Now don't go around where you once been if you're not spiritually strong enough. Don't get it twisted. And I'm telling you, God will let you know. Let Him lead. I did that too early, too, too quick. And I've been right back where I was trying to help people. Don't get in a hurry. God will let you know when your time. While we're helping others, that's when God sees our help. David was a type of Christ. But he wasn't. There's no one like Christ. The Christ. They came because the Spirit of God was in David. That's who they were drawn to. Church people are drawn to you. They find favor in you. Lead them to the way. <coughs> Explain to them where that everlasting water is that they're looking for out here drinking of the world in the pits. It's temporal. I want something that's going to last forever. And I got it. On January 25th, at about probably 6.15, 2014, beyond any shadow of a doubt, when I hit my knees and I come up, I took a big drink. Amen. <laughs> All things changed Amen. tremendously. I'm still the same old Reggie, but I ain't no sinner. I'm born again. He puts something different in your pipe to smoke. He gives you something better to eat. God's good. He's speaking to you. I don't care where it's at. I tell people all the time, if God's speaking to you tonight, come and let's pray. If you know beyond a shadow of a doubt, come tonight and let's pray. If you're driving in your car and you know beyond a shadow of a doubt God is speaking to you to turn your life to Him, you better do it. Promise me you'll do it. When He speaks, you will be obedient. You will cry out. You will obtain salvation. You'll have eternal life. You'll have life and have it more abundantly. It takes obedience. He's done paid the price. You have to accept it. He knocks. We have to open the door. Amen. God will save you in the church house, the chicken house, the dog house, the out house, the white house, the black house, the green house, wherever you're at. When he speaks, you say, I surrender. I didn't know what that old boy was going to answer where he lost his slop bucket. But it didn't matter. He knew that he had put, his, put her down, buddy. He knew he had put it down. Whether it was in the pew he wanted to tell somebody. That's what I tell him. I say, you acknowledge you're lost. You believe Jesus died to save you. You confess your sins. And you'll want to claim it. Yes, sir. It ain't going to be like, I think I'm saved. I think I got saved last night. You will know when you get saved. Amen. If you don't know that you know that you know you're on your way to heaven, let's pray. Amen. It's a no-so salvation. God lets us know whether we're treating people right. He lets us know when there's something that's hindering our prayer life. We need to work it out. We need to get it right, church. We wonder why there's less power. There's no less in God's power. It's us not being able to obtain it because things that's in our life. Let's reach out for it tonight. I just want to be obedient. I just preach what He gives me. I love each and every one of you. If you're here tonight and you're lost, you're the most important person in here. The most important person in here. Amen. Search your heart. Make tonight be the night that you know you get redeemed. 
We wanted to name this Redemption Revival. Because that's the ultimate goal is to get people redemption. To obtain salvation. You have to repent of your sins. We as a church don't have to tell people they're living wrong. We don't have to tell people that they're doing wrong. They already know. When I was living wrong, I knew it. I didn't need more people to tell me I'm living wrong. That ain't what saves you. That ain't going to lead people to Christ. You need to tell people that they don't have to live that way. We've got to show them the love. As they sing tonight, that's all He's given me. I'm always available. I'll help you any way I can. If you're lost, reach out to me. If you're saved and you need help, reach out to me, Jason. It's in order, bro. Stand up, let him have it.